Scene one lights up, 1986. Library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. Evening. Johnny Dunn, a transplanted New Yorker in his 30s, is alone in his office. He is a film librarian and the room is filled with movie memorabilia, shelves of film reels and books on the film industry. Four posters are prominently displayed behind him. They are images of famous American movie stars from the 1930s and 40s. Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, and Spencer Tracy. The fourth is a poster of the Dead End Kids, teen actors who portray juvenile delinquents in movies with Bogart and Cagney. Johnny moves away from his desk and moves downstage. We notice that he limps a bit with his left leg. He wears a dress shirt and tie with the tie loosened. Johnny speaks directly to audience. I'm Johnny Dunn. This is the Library Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Well, this isn't the library, this is my office, which explains the mess. I've got a lot of stuff, all movie related, films, books, posters, you name it. Why is it so quiet? It's after regular hours, and I do my best work at night. Maybe it's commuting with the ghosts of actors. These particular posters behind me, Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, Spencer Tracy, I grew up watching these actors' movies on TV with my dad in the 50s and 60s. They were from my dad's era of matinee idols and movie stars. Dad pointing out to me who this actor was and that, and the different pictures they made. <laughs> I ate it up. I guess you could say it was our way of bonding, sitting there in the living room watching the early show on weeknights. Picture on a Sunday afternoon, too. But I had a special window into these guys, the Dead End Kids. They were New York teenagers who played juvenile delinquents from the slums. First on Broadway in the play Dead End, then in the movie adaptation out in Hollywood. Bogart was in the movie version. They went on to make Crime School with Bogart, Angels with Dirty Faces with James Cagney, and They Made Me a Criminal with John Garfield. <coughs> Those were in the late 1930s. They went on and did spinoffs of the Dead End Kids, which was how I first got acquainted with them. My window was Hunts Hall, who usually played the dopey one. That's him on the left. The photo is from They Made Me a Criminal. My dad knew Hunts from the old neighborhood in Manhattan on 30th Street. Hunts lived up near 2nd Avenue, and my dad was near 1st. I started to imagine my dad in the movies, too. So much of what I pictured of my dad growing up in New York during the Depression was based on scenes from old movies. My dad wasn't a dead-end kid, but I put him there, in my mind. There's plenty more I could tell, but it'll come. Johnny exits. Lights down. Scene two. Bar restaurant in North Hollywood later that same night. Johnny sits at bar and listens to jazz music from a group tucked in the corner. We just hear the music. He has a mixed drink in front of him. There is an eating area divided from the bar by a trellis. It's early in the week, so there is a light crowd. <coughs> a couple in their 60s are seated. They are actor Hunts Hall and his wife Lee. They are conversing and listening to the music. They've finished the main meal. The music stops, and the leader, pianist, makes an announcement after applause. Thank you. We're taking a short break, and we'll be back in 20, so stick around. Once again, we're the Doug Keys Trio. Bravo. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you Hunts Hall? Yeah. How are you? I'm Johnny Dunn. You knew my father, Tom Dunn, from East 30th in New York when you were growing up? Tommy Dunn? You're Tommy Dunn's kid? Yes. Gee, that's something. How are you, Johnny? How's your old man? Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago. Congestive heart failure. Sorry to hear that. Really, your father was a great guy. He meant a lot to me. The whole family, the Dunns, they lived down the middle of the block from us. They were near First Avenue. We were in the middle of the block. Uh, wait a minute, excuse me. I forgot to introduce my wife. Lee? Johnny Dunn. I was real close to his family when we were kids on the east side. <clears throat> nice to meet you, Lee. Pleasure. You come here before? First time. A friend of mine mentioned the group. He knows I like jazz, so I thought I'd check him out. They're good, right? I know Doug Key's the leader. We come here now and then. I really like them. Say, Johnny, pull up a chair. Join us. You eat yet? 
I had something earlier. Then join us for uh, coffee, will you? Sure. Our friends couldn't make it at the last minute. I uh, reserved the table for four. Grab a cup, Johnny. I'll pour you some. Maybe you want tea? Or something else? A drink, maybe? Dessert? No, just coffee's fine, thanks. <coughs> Good for the drive home. Where you living, Johnny? Santa Monica. A little north of the pier. Oh, Santa Monica's nice. Got the ocean breeze. I like the ocean. We're near here in an apartment, North Hollywood. Real, really sorry about your dad. <clears throat> How about Strawberry? Is he still alive? <laughs> my uncle Buster? Yeah, yeah, he was older than your father. He died a couple years before my dad. Same thing. <clears throat> Heart. That's too bad, too bad. Oh, well, we had a lot of fun back then. You ever hear the story about how he got his name? <laughs> My dad told me it was because Buster got caught stealing strawberries from a root and <laughs> That's right, that's right. Mr. Mangano saw him trying to take them off the push cart on 2nd Avenue. So he grabbed a box of strawberries, and he grabbed your uncle's arm, and he twisted it. Mm -hmm. Don't you go steal, and nothing from me. You bad boy, you bomb. I called the cop on you. Mm -hmm. And your uncle's face turned turned beet red and he ran down 29th Street fast as anything. We named him Strawberry Bum after that. <laughs> Lee, you should have seen it. Well, listen, Johnny, I'd like you to talk some more, but we need to shove off. It's getting late. Sure. I have to get going myself. Why don't I give you my number and you can come by sometime to the apartment? You got a pen? <clears throat> sure. I always carry these. Like a writer, huh? Sort of. Hope to. That's great. That's great, Johnny. Jeez. You know, I'm glad you came over, really. I am. We're going to wait for the check, and then we're going to head out. So I'll say good night. Nice to meet you, Lee. Mm -hmm. Bye, Hans. Sure, Johnny. Give me a call. We'll get together soon. Nice kid, huh? Uh -huh. Boy, boy. What are the chances I'd run into Tommy Dunn's kid in Los Angeles <laughs> all these years after I've seen his father? Yeah, what are the chances? Lights down. Scene three. Johnny sits at desk in his office at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science Library. He's absorbed with a book. There's a 16 millimeter projector set up with a film reel on it. It is the film, Dead End. The screen is frozen to a black and white image of a 1930s New York waterfront scene at the end of a block. There are mostly tenements with one luxury building at left on the screen. A group of white male teens fooling around, carrying on. There's a knock on the door from outside, and Hunts walks in. He sees the image on the screen and knows exactly what will be said by his character when Hunts was a teenager. Hey, look at me. I got a machine gun. Ah! <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to startle you, Johnny. Uh, sorry. I, I got so involved in this book on Hollywood in the 30s, I forgot you were coming over. Oh, that's okay. And I could tell you plenty about Hollywood, at least the beginning with the late 30s. And... Uh, when we came out here to make that picture. You were doing one of your lines from Dead End when you walked in. I'm amazed you had the film queued up to that spot. It's a great line. I was just going over the film knowing you were stopping by. Then, like I said. Great coincidence that you were at that piece in the movie. That was my audition piece with Sidney Kings Kingsley for the part uh, on Broadway. Well, I certainly want to hear that story. Sure, sure. I love to talk. <laughs> Listen, Johnny, I didn't say anything uh, when we first met at the restaurant, but what's with the limp? It's a long story. That's fine. I've got a few hours. <laughs> I'm glad you could have me here at your job, too. Next time you'll come to the apartment, Lee can fix us some dinner. You've got to be some fan of ours to, with this poster. It's so prominent here with Bogart, Cagney, Tracy, that's me in the straw hat on the left. Then Gabe, Bobby, Bernard, on top Leo, Leo in the center with Billy. I worked with Bogey and Cagney. As for Tracy, I got to be friends uh, with Spencer because I picked him out of the gutter one night in New York, Gramercy Park. He was stumbled down drunk in the rain, a real mess. I mean, I love the guy. Who didn't love Spencer Tracy? What an actor. I got him cleaned up and I took him back to his hotel where he was staying in Brooklyn, off the beaten path so people wouldn't find him. I took care of him that night. 
and he slept in the bed, I slept on the chair, and I ordered him breakfast the next morning. Then I ducked out while he was still asleep. Poor guy. Tremendous actor, but he was haunted. He told me that night, in drunken fashion, how God punished him for cheating on his wife Louise by making their son Johnny born deaf. Mm. Rough stuff, that Irish guilt. I saw plenty of it in my own family and others growing up. Tracy would never divorce his wife. But he spent years with Katherine Hepburn, common knowledge in Hollywood back then. She tried to take care of him, but he would still go off on these benders. He mentioned Kate and how much he, he loved her, but how much he could never leave his wife. Trapped. Imagine one of the greatest American actors of all time holed up in some dump in Brooklyn. I learned a bit about Tracy's real early years as an actor from uh, Sterling Holloway. Sterling and me had two scenes together in a picture called The Walk in the Sun. We got to be very friendly. You know Sterling. He had that high-pitched voice and a laugh. Light, curly, uh, blonde hair. He worked forever. He told me that Tracy was behind him in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, even though Tracy was older than Sterling. Well, Tracy was placed in his second year, right? Away in the stock company that Sterling was already in. Sterling marveled at how believable the guy was in comedy, in drama, no matter how, how small the part was. He always looked at Tracy on stage, and, and for my money, that was the same way up on the screen when he got in the movies. I tell you, I was so excited one time when Tracy came to the matinee of Dead End. It was a couple of weeks before Christmas. I remember because Tracy came backstage after the show, shook all our hands, and gave us a big Merry Christmas, boys. Then he left. He said how convincing we were as kids from the streets living at the bottom of society. Tracy looked like he was from the bottom of society the night I found him sprawled out in the gutter. I'm glad I found him, though, and glad I helped him. I got him out of trouble one night anyway. He sent me a note of thanks back in Hollywood a few weeks later. I still have the note. You're the only one I ever told this story to. I figured no sense in spreading something that could only hurt him. But he's gone now, so I guess it doesn't matter. And I know you have great respect for the man, too. I, I read somewhere Hepburn saying it wasn't acting that Spencer ever had a problem with. It was life. She said, functioning out, of, out in the world, that's where, that's where it was tough for Tracy. So how's life been? Tough for you out here with that, that limp and all? Yeah, I noticed it when you were walking away in the restaurant. How'd you get it? Sit down, relax. No sense putting pressure on that leg. Now tell me what happened. Uh, it was about three months ago. Angry husband with a gun. Oh, one of those, huh? Ooh. He wing it? No, missed. I messed up my leg jumping off the balcony. <laughs> Lucky there was grass in the backyard. Lucky is right. Takes a trained stuntman to do that kind of a fall and not get hurt. Was the leg broken? No, ankle. So you love her? Sure I do. That's bad. Why? Well, it explains why you didn't just blow out of town. It means you still want to stay and fight. Well, yeah. Listen, Johnny, love is swell, but bullets are real. Buzz <laughs> gets up and looks around at some of the books on the shelf. He picks out one entitled Cagney and flips through it. This biography of Cagney has a good shot of me and the guys with him in Angels with Dirty Faces. This girl you stuck on, uh, what's her name? You weren't with her at the restaurant, were you? Uh, Francie. Francie, no kidding. Bogey's character, Babyface Martin in Dead End. His old girlfriend's name, Francie. She becomes a prostitute. Some coincidence, huh? Uh, my Francie's no prostitute. Hey, hey, take it easy, Johnny. I only meant about the, the name. I can see you're crazy about it. Blonde bombshell. Those bombshells can be murdered. Take it from me. Blonde, but no bombshell. We're trying to play it cool right now. She's separated from her husband. She moved out of the apartment and she was staying with a girlfriend in Sherman Oaks. Then she got a call from Ohio. Her mother is sick, so uh, she went back to look after her. Francie figures she'll stay until the divorce comes through. It's rough being without her. Sorry, Johnny. I'm just trying to get a full picture. I'm not knocking you, girl. 
I think it's best she went back home for a while until that hothead husband is uh, out of the picture and becomes an ex. Your mom's still alive? Yes. Uh, lives with my sister on Long Island. She's married and has a couple kids. Mom helps her out with them. My sister's a nurse and she works full time. I'm glad to hear your mom is with family and not alone. That's got to make you feel better. <clears throat> so let's just relax and talk. No more pressure for me. It's pretty rare I get out of the house without Lee. You know, I've been living in L.A. now over 60 years. With some tri trips back to New York now and then. My son Gary, he's a Protestant minister, a scholar like you. He teaches English at UCLA. He's a husband and a father. I have a very close relationship with my uh, grandson, Oliver. Johnny opens a lower drawer in his desk and takes out a half-full bottle of whiskey and two shot glasses. He uncaps the bottle and pours two drinks. He offers one to Hunts. No thanks. I finally get it, gave it up years ago. Maybe, maybe you've been watching too many old detective movies, Johnny. Hey, I don't want to stop you from having a drink. No way. I'm good. Uh, Maybe later. It's just that it can really get the uh, upper hand. Take it from me. And Leo, he had his share of troubles. Car accidents, women, marriages. Hey, I did too, with the marriages. But Leo, early on when we were doing the Bowery Boys series after the war, Leo got heavy into the drinking. He stopped doing the series and went up north now the producers, they wanted me to step in and continue, but I said, no, no way. I wouldn't do it without Leo. It took almost a year for him to come back, and when he did, we picked it up again. Some real loyalty on your part. I love Leo, loved him. He and I were a team, I dug him. I loved them all. Gaby and Bernard, Billy and Bobby. Bobby had big problems with the booze too. Of the original gang, Leo and I continued the longest together in the pictures. The Bowery Boys was really built around me and Leo. And as the leads, you know, the bits between us. You looked very close together on screen in those later East Side Kids and Bowery Boys movie. Couple cut-ups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It got to be comedy over the years. You can thank the Hayes Commission for that. <laughs> when we made Dead End in those first few pictures, we played street kids, juvenile delinquents. The Hayes Commission put pressure on the studios to clean us up. That started about 1940. They were afraid we were giving bad image to the youth of America. Like, we're going to corrupt them? We were portraying reality. Reality of the cities and the depression. They wanted Mickey Rooney playing Andy Hardy <laughs> with the nice mom and dad and the nice small town and the white picket fence and the nice girl next door. That's when I added the baseball cap when the pictures became lighter. The cap is true Americana. We pretty much were moved away from the full-length movies. Juan has sold our contracts. We made the Little Tough Guys series, then the East Side Kids. We were no longer playing hoodlums. We started to save the day and fight bad guys. It was East Side Kids where Leo became head of the gang. Billy was in the service during the war. Things changed. My, my character became much funnier. I was second banana to Leo, and that became more prominent with the Bowery Boys as comic leads. But before all that, before the war, you made the full-length Angels Wash Their Faces with Ronald Reagan. Yeah. The title shows the shift, doesn't it? Who knew Reagan's going to be governor of California and then the president? <laughs> the movie with Reagan was no, no comparison to Angels with Dirty Faces. Cagney, the great actor James Cagney. Oh, I was really proud to be in that picture with him. We all were. Leo got on his wrong side, though. Leo was fooling around with his lines one day, and Cagney came up to him and straight on palm shot sent him flying. <laughs> I think it was Bobby who was standing behind Leo, and he fell down when Leo crashed into him. <laughs> Cagney was a no-nonsense guy. Not like Bogey. Bogey would kid around with you, play stickball with us, practical jokes. But Leo, Leo didn't give Cagney, didn't give Cagney any more trouble after that. Ooh. I've read that Leo Gorsi wasn't even that interested in acting. No, once Leo had money and we were doing the Bowery Boys, he had a ranch up north. He'd rather be up there with the cows and the chickens. That's where he went. 
When I told you about the year off during Bowery Boys, he was up there. It was Leo's father that wanted him to audition for the play, Dead End, originally. Leo was working as a plumber's assistant to his uncle, but his father, Bernard, was an actor who had a long run on Broadway in a play called Abby's Irish Rose. One time, Leo went down to the rehearsal hall for Dead End, and he was out of work because his brother David was cast in the play, so Leo got cast too in what was a rival gang, the Second Avenue Boys. Eventually, Leo moved up with us as Spit when the first guy left, a kid named uh, Charlie Duncan. So I'm glad Leo came in. Funny because Leo's father, Bernard, eventually worked with us as a regular in the Bowery Boys. He was Louie, who ran Louie's Sweet Shop. That was Leo's father? Absolutely, Bernard Gorsi. When he died in the mid-50s, that was it for Leo. He left the series for good. Oh, Leo was devastated. Let's get back to you. Tell me more about Francie. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, she's sweet and, and pretty and smart. And this guy, this guy that took a shot at you, is he a louse, right? He hit Francie a few times. Ooh. Why do nice dames always get mixed up with bums? <laughs> Sounds like you know a lot about women. And you made out okay with the ladies. Uh, I've been married four times, if that proves anything. <laughs> Lee's the fourth and the last. I wasn't the greatest looking guy, I, I, I know that. My birth name was Henry. But one of my brothers called me Hunts because he said I looked German. World War I, the Germans were called the Huns. I used humor with the girls. So you became a character actor. Yeah, I could sing when I was a kid in the Madison Square Boys Quartet, but dead end, yeah, I was destined to be a character. With my looks, and comedy became my forte. Now back to you, back to you. You're a decent guy, what a nice looking guy. <coughs> No matinee idol, okay, that's when <laughs> I'm glad you, you got Francie. Just go slow. Go slow. Until she gets that divorce. Is she originally from Ohio? Columbus. I bet she came out here to be in pictures. Sort of. She wanted to be a set designer for movies. Even that's a tough racket. She ever make it? She did a couple indies with some young UCLA grads. And she worked on one feature, the comedy splash. Now she's mostly doing window displays for department stores like Nordstrom's to get by. No shame in that. And the husband? How'd she hook up with him? He's from Ohio, too. She met him a few years back at some networking meeting for transplanted Ohioans. <laughs> Midwestern is reaching out in L.A., huh? I guess you go with people you have something in common with, or you're drawn to them because they're doing something you aspire to. I'd say it was the first case for Francie. That word you used, aspiring. That picture I mentioned earlier, A Walk in the Sun, World War II movie, serious picture. I was in the movie with Dana Andrews and Lloyd Bridges. It's the invasion of Italy and our platoon is on the march. One scene, I'm walking along with this Sterling Holloway character. And I'm telling him about my kid sister back home who was crazy about the band leader, Russ Columbo. Sterling often played comic characters in movies too, so we were good together. In another scene, another scene with Sterling, the platoon is sitting in the woods. I pick up a leaf and I look at it and I start talking to him about its complexity. And that leads <coughs> to me into talking about life in general, philosophically, you know. I received the New York theater critic's circle blue a ribbon for that. I enjoyed being in that picture. I had missed good scripts like that when we were in Dead End and Angels. And they made, they made me a criminal. Those were our best movies, as far as I'm concerned. And I was hungry to be in a picture like this war movie, but the offers weren't coming in after that. I was pretty typecast for comedy because that was the way our pictures had gone, that direction, with the East Side Kids. I went with the Bowery Boys series because that's what I got offered. I wish now I had held out for a role in another drama. Could have been a small part, like a role in A Walk in the Sun. I really only had two major scenes with Sterling. I, I wish I trusted myself more, my talent, but Hollywood's a business. You know, I had to work. I've never watched A Walk in the Sun. I'll have to put that down on my list. When I would watch the dead-end kids movies, I would find myself looking for my dad. I mean, when I was just a kid. It was like I was hunting for history about him. 
So looking at the streets and the buildings and the cars and angels with dirty faces, I was seeing the New York of the 30s that you and my dad grew up in. And seeing what the tenement buildings looked like? It seemed real to me. Even though it was a movie set, the rough feel, the poverty in the streets, that would be there for me to feed on as an actor. I remember one real bad time, right, right on my block in New York during the Depression. A family got evicted because they couldn't make the rent. They were good, I think, four months behind with the story was going around. But this wasn't so unusual. It was the Depression. So many people out of work, we were lucky. My old man was an engineer. But this family, the, the Ryans, your father knew them. What was, what was tough for me is I knew the middle sister, Julia, pretty well. She was sweet on me. So there they are, all the furniture is out on the pavement. And the kid boy, Frankie, he's maybe five or six. And he's having a grand old time. He's sitting on the top of the couch running along the kitchen table, swinging his feet. To him, it's like a party or something. It was uh, autumn. It was better than winter, but Julia's sitting there with her mother and on the sofa, and Mrs. Ryan is ashamed, but she's trying to hold up. Same with Julia's older sister, Peggy. But Julia's really embarrassed. She's maybe 14, a year younger than me. I was, I was in Dead End on Broadway, so I had some dough. We were getting 35 bucks a week which is big money in them years. I couldn't just blow it. We had a huge family, 16 kids. I was number 14. Anyway, I had a few bucks in my pocket. I was standing across the street with some other kids watching the scene, and it got to me, seeing Julia crying. So I went over, <coughs> not to be a pastor to hurt a pride or embarrass her. I caught Mrs. Ryan's eye and I nodded to her. She got Julia to look at me. Then I, I motioned for Julia to come over here where I was standing. She was wiping her eyes with a handkerchief as she came over and it was, it was hard to look at her. I put my arm around her shoulder and I got her to walk a little down the block and I took her hand and I opened it. This was the hand without the handkerchief. I gently unfolded it and pulled out a ten spot from my pants pocket that I had folded up. I didn't want to be conspicuous and I placed that in her hand and pressed her fingers down gently. Well, she opened her hand and saw it and was, saw there was a 10. And she smiled at me and started crying too. It was kind of like seeing a sun shower. Beautiful. I put my hand on her chin and she slowly stopped crying and smiled again. And she whispered, thank you, and kissed me on the cheek. Then she walked back to her mother with her hands folded and sat down and hugged her mom. Ten bucks wasn't going to stop them from being evicted, but at least they wouldn't starve. Mr. Ryan came a little later with his brother. They were in an old truck. The story was they were going to stay with Mr. Ryan's brother and his family up in the Bronx. Us guys helped load the furniture onto the back of the truck. Mrs. Ryan and the kids went to take the subway uptown, and Mr. Ryan and his brother got back in the truck. Frankie broke away and convinced his pop to let him sit in the cab. So Mrs. Ryan and her daughters walked to catch the train. Julia turned to look at me as if they were going, and she smiled again and waved. I waved back. Usually guys would rib you about stuff like that, but this was a sad day. And everyone knew it. I never saw Julia again. That's rough. I remember my dad say that my grandmother would keep pleading with the landlord when she didn't have all the rent. She did give him two dollars and say she'd have the rest the following Friday. She wasn't the only one, I'm certain. There was no joke in those days. My dad would talk about how kids could go for the movies for a quarter and stay there all day. And coming up with a quarter wasn't so easy either. But what a way to escape from life for a while. Movies were big, big. We had movies, we had radio, no TV though. I would watch the old movies on TV, and my dad would know all the names of all the actors and tell me. Those black and white films from the 30s and 40s, like in the movie San Francisco, based on the 1906 earthquake. My dad would say, that's Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable. Great picture, great picture. Back. <laughs> so Gable is his friend. They're a little at odds in this film. They have a fist fight, but my dad said Gable and Tracy were good friends in real life. I didn't understand what he meant when he said in real life. I thought movies were real. I thought actors walked around in Hollywood the way they were in the movies, and that they were having conversations on screen that were just natural. When my father said there were people who wrote the lines that actors said, 
I was blown away. You should try your hand at screenwriting. I wish I had better connections in the business these days. But you're here. That should help you. And I can tell you, getting to know you, that you listen. You listen to, you take in people's stories. That's important for a writer. Wherever you get the ideas, they're out there. Just like I've been hearing that you picked up so much from your father. I was completely absorbed by the stories from his childhood. My dad told me back in the 30s, he and his friends used to go down to Union Square and throw tomatoes at the communists. <laughs> I didn't go for that myself. Probably because the singing and the acting started getting me busy. But that communism stuff, fear, fear, that's how I see it. Started to take hold out in Hollywood after the, after the war. The serious stuff happened in the late 40s with the House on American Activities Commission. And they went after communists in Hollywood. They hounded John Garfield. And he was no communist. Liberal lefty from the group theater, yeah. But no communist. That uh, Huac, H-U-A-C, they twisted a good thing into bed. You probably know a lot of this through your uh, reading. But here's one you wouldn't have heard of. Me and John, Warner Brothers Studios sent us down to Los Angeles Harbor, down at Long Beach with a, when a Russian sh sub came in. The U.S. was allies with Russia at this point in the war. So Jack Warner wanted us to greet the sailors. We went out to meet them with the sub docked. Public relations kind of stuff. Goddamn bastards, they used that against John. And the studio, they just kept quiet. That's the way it was. John was a star. He got crucified. I met uh, Ilya Kazan in the early 40s through Billy Halleck. Billy was in a, a movie with Kazan called Blues in the Night. They played jazz musicians. It was a good movie. John told me about working with Kazan in the 30s with the group theater. Funny, I like, uh, I like jazz and I like that movie. Kazan was a good director. I don't think he should have named names like he did in the investigation. He got off easy by testifying. Poor John, they hounded him, boy. Tough break, he died so young. I love John. I wish I could have been in more pictures with him. Bogey and Cagney were, were an older generation, even, even though Bogey liked to fool around with us. But John was closer to us in age. I got to be good friends with John. John was solid, great actor, great guy. When we were shooting, they made me a criminal out in Riverside on a big farm. John would tell us stories about being with the group, appearing in Clifford Odette's plays. Well, John was serious about the stage. I guess you didn't get the chance because of what you were saying about the studio not wanting the dead-end kids to keep up the juvenile delinquent angle. Goddamn Hayes Commission. That's all. John usually played tough guys on the screen back then, and we were playing tough kids. Jesus, John was one fine actor. I worked with the best once upon a time. You make the dialogue seem real and true, like you're having these thoughts and saying these things for the first time. <laughs> and me believing it wasn't written dialogue? Just talking? Like you said. You didn't know they were actors. I guess. I mean, I thought they were special, but I couldn't distinguish. My dad told me once in the 50s, when Phil Silvers had the Sergeant Bilko show on TV, Dad saw the character, Private Dwayne Doberman, walking along the sidewalk in Manhattan, and he met the actor who played him, but I imagined he saw him in his army uniform. Huh. I remember that. And, and I remember my dad smiling and laughing and saying, just in regular everyday clothes, he's an actor, you know? <laughs> Some people thought me and the guys were really juvenile delinquents who beat up other kids, stole wallets. I see what you mean. I probably thought that too, but you were good guys deep on the inside. I had a good upbringing. My father had a solid job with the city of New York. Otherwise, we could have been in big trouble, too, during the Depression. The huge family we had. Things were tough. My father died in 1937, just before the movie premiere of Dead End that summer. I took a train back to New York for the wake and funeral. I wore the same black suit to the premiere that I wore for the services. Long trip back and forth on train. A lot of time to think. After the funeral and burial, I talked to my mother about maybe I should stay in New York and help her out, not to go back to Hollywood. But she wouldn't hear any of it. That's your career. You're going to be a big success in pictures. And the truth was, 
she could use the money I made. I mean, we were making $600 a week on that film. A huge amount of money back then. If you were making $60 a week on a regular job, that would be a fortune. $30 a week was good in them days for the average job. So I went back, got there in time for the premiere. Funny about a crossroads take. Uh, that kind of thing, maybe. I could have made it in the theater in New York. I mean, we were on Broadway with Dead End for a long time, 687. 687 shows. But I was a, an ensemble with the guys, yeah. We were New York actors and proud of it out there in Hollywood. But I'm not sure I could have made it in New York, made progress without the other guys in those early days. We were a team. Well, like I like to say, roads take and not take, and that's a long, long time ago. Late in his career, Billy Hallop ended up as a recurring character, playing a friend of Carol O'Connor's on uh, All in the Family. Billy's character had the uh, taxi cab company. That's quite a change from being the leader of the Dead End Kids. It's a tough business. Once the war came, that kind of broke us up, really. Billy's voice never got deeper. It was okay when we were kids, but it never took the uh, depth you need to play a leading man. He could have been the next John Garfield. That's what he was being groomed for. But I think, Viv I think Billy's voice really held him back. Lots of child actors seem to have a difficult time making the transition. But we weren't children. We were in our teens. Leo and I continued to play older teenagers with the Bowery Boys. Ever think you stayed too long with the series? Sure. But a job's a job. Any regrets? Uh, sometimes I wish I, I tried for more parts and serious movies after A Walk in the Sun. But the uh, offer for the Bowery Boys came with Leo, and it was fun and comfortable. We were on top with the Bowery Boys, but we were also stuck, too. Leo made a serious picture with uh, Edward G. Robinson during the war. Played a sailor in the Navy. Leo got typecast too with comedy, and he, he lost his good looks because he got heavy with all the booze. And Leo's also on the short side too. That was okay for Eddie Robinson, but he was Edward G. Robinson. Well, look at Dustin Hoffman. I mean, he's short. Well, Dustin is exceptional. Exceptionally talented. And by the time Dustin came along, it got to be okay to be Jewish, okay to be ethnic. Dustin's nose and shortness never hurt him once he made Mrs. Robinson. I mean the movie. The Graduate. <laughs> <laughs> but that's funny. You like that, huh? Sometimes I think kids in the 60s, the rebellious, feel they invented sex before marriage and taking drugs. We were the first hippies. Our hair was long, but unkempt long. Kids from the slums who couldn't afford haircuts. That's true enough, but I did get busted for pot. The cops planted it in my apartment. I got off. You never know what's going to help your career. I was friends with Shemp Howard, Moe's brother from the Three Stooges. I learned so much about comic timing from Shemp. And I used to stand on the set and watch W.C. Fields, too, when he was filming uh, a genius. Wow. Where does all that time go? I've been in the business since I was a baby, and we came out to Hollywood in 1937 to shoot Dead End. Now it's just me. Gaby and Bernard left. Bobby died first in 1965. Then Leo in 1969. Billy's 1976. In the winter of 76, I was walking around Washington Square. I graduated from Fordham with my BA in English the previous May. I'd heard good things about the film school at NYU. I wanted to apply but couldn't get myself to enter the administration building. I was interested most in screenwriting, but it didn't seem real. It didn't seem like someone from my background could do it. When my father saw my course schedule for my last semester of senior year, he gave me grief about taking an intro to acting class. An elective in the last semester of senior year? What the hell are you taking that for? What good's that going to do you? And he's the one I sat weeknights watching old movies with on TV. He's the one who really got me interested in movies. And he could see it. Christ, it wasn't one of the best things we ever did together, him and me. Well, I took the class, and I choked when I was doing the Biff and Happy, the Biff and Happy scene in their old bedroom in Death of a Salesman. This was my final for the course, and the lines went right out the window. I'd memorized the lines, I'd rehearsed with my partner, 
but in the floor in the theater in the round in front of the class and teacher, right out the window. I was so embarrassed, devastated really. And the instructor, Mr. Gilbraith, he told me to take a break, step outside, and we'd go at the end of the group. I felt terrible for my partner. Tony, uh, I forget his last name, but I can see his face as he struggled to help me. I went upstairs into the student center. There was an art gallery in the hallway. I stood looking blankly at the paintings. And while I was standing there, my friend Gloria, a girl I'd had a crush on for over a year, she was passing by and saw me. I was so ashamed. I was hoping I had some natural talent with acting that could come out with some training. Boy, I hated myself right then. But Gloria? Gloria believed in me. She talked me through it. This hole I was in, I was able to go back into the theater again and do the scene. I struggled with a couple lines. I was still nervous. But this time, I was able to look at Tony and connect more. Look at his eyes as we got through the scene. He hugged me after it. And we got applause. But that tear, it was too much. Well, it was tough. So you went up on your lines, big deal. <laughs> it happens, it happened to me. But you recover. The other actor you're talking to can help. He can help you a lot by trusting the actors you're with. I've been doing dinner theater down in Orange County these days. Sometimes you forget a line. A good actor can cover for another one. That's the trust. Sure you get nervous at times. It can panic you. But terror? It gets easier if you want it bad enough. Yes, I didn't. I never took another acting class, and I couldn't buck my father's negativeness about me taking that class. I couldn't walk into NYU and get the application for film school because that critical voice of my dad was running in my head so loudly. Your father was just watching out for you, like a father should. He was being practical. Poverty. That's where he grew up. That shapes you forever. I was lucky because I got a break early in show business. So I went to library school at St. John's. I got a scholarship and that kind of clinched the deal. I liked books, so what the hell? I had a friend who was in the program, so like I said. And they gave me a part-time job in the college library. What the hell? And here you are working with the things you love. All these cans of film with gifts of material inside for you to look at. I had a break at the end of the master's program. I got a part-time job at the Museum of Modern Art's Film Archive. I learned a lot from the director. We got a long time. I was working there about a year and working as a waiter in a place on the east side, not far from Noah. There was a full-time job opening here at the Motion Picture Academy that my boss received a notice about. He asked me if I was interested. I said yes. He made a couple of calls on my behalf and recommended me. I actually interviewed over the phone after sending in my resume. It was an assistant position, but solid. So they offered and I went. Tough to leave your family. Hardest with my mom. What did your father think? He encouraged me to go. He knew I was always crazy about L.A. and the movies, even though I'd never been out west. So he was in your corner? Yeah. Uh. I see. Dad said he understood about wanting to be out in California, based on his time there during the war. I remember him saying how he met you on the street in Hollywood on Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. He was on a weekend pass when he was stationed at Marsh Field, the Army Air Force Base out in Riverside. That's right. That's right. We just ran into each other. I didn't even know he was stationed here. I heard from back home that he was in the service, but I, I didn't have any of the details. Oh, what a time we had that week, Ellie. I took him to a party that, that Leo was throwing. Now, Leo really tied one on that night. You come to think of it, we all did. Your father stayed over at my place. Then he hitched a ride back to the base the next afternoon. He was in uniform. It was pretty easy for guys in uniform to get lifts hitchhiking during the war. Oh, that was a long time ago. We've had Vietnam since then, Korea. I was lucky just to miss being in that. Oh, you bet you were, yeah. A lot, of ch a lot has changed in this country and everything. Hey, I better get going. Lee will be wondering what's happened. Listen, I want you to come over to the apartment real soon. We can make a trip to my storage unit. I have tons of memorabilia out there. You'd get a real kick out of it. I know you would. Lights down, scene four. <coughs> Hunson Lee's apartment, North Hollywood. A few weeks later, it is a relatively clean, modest apartment. The living room has a TV and a video player. Lee and Hunts have been arguing. <coughs> I don't want you taking him over to your storage unit. God knows what he'll take. Are you crazy? He's a nice kid. I grew up with his father, for Christ's sakes. 
do you have to be so suspicious about everybody? He's using you, mark my word. Make up an excuse that we're having uh, an out-of-town guest coming later. We were planning to watch Angels with Dirty Faces and then taking a drive over to the unit. He's a librarian with the Academy. He loves movie memorabilia. And he's willing to help me organize everything. I have so much. And I want it to stay that way. You don't want to make an excuse? I will. You just go along with it. All right, all right. Doorbell rings. Hans gets up and opens the door. Johnny enters. Hey, Johnny. Hi, Hans. Hi, Lee. <laughs> Hello. I'll, I'll put some coffee on. But sit down. I've got the video ready. It's all in the player. They sit on the couch. Don't forget that we have uh, Helen coming down from Santa Barbara later. Right, okay. Sorry. Turns out Lee had a last minute call from a girlfriend up in Santa Barbara. Said she really needed to get away and spend some time with Lee, so that means you and me won't have that much time. We'll have to put off the storage unit for another visit. Oh, we can reschedule. No, 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 stay. I feel bad about this. It's no problem, really. Oh, Johnny, no. We have a little time. I'd like to see what, what you think some of the key scenes from the movie are. He enters with coffee and puts tray on the table. Oh, thanks, hon. Thanks, Lee. Lee leaves room but stands in hall to eavesdrop. Hunts clicks on the video and fast forwards to an early scene where the dead end kids tried to steal fruit from a vendor's cart. This scene always reminds me of back in the old days when your uncle got caught stealing the strawberries. <laughs> I pictured that too once my dad told me the story. That memory came to me when we were shooting on the lot. Great stuff, huh? The scene also reminds me of the story my dad used to tell me about the gangster who flipped open the lid of the vendor's cart, pulled out a machine gun, and mowed down another guy in the street. Holy Jesus, how could I forget that one? That's right. That was by 31st Street. Tall guy in a black fedora, top coat. He rips a Tommy gun out, Tommy gun out of the uh, push cart and blasts the other guy away uh, right on the sidewalk. Some of the produce rolls and stops by the body, carrots, tomatoes. It was a Sunday morning, I'll never forget it, in the spring. That made the shots even sound louder because of the quiet. I was still a kid in the early 30s. I've been coming home from Mass, Jesus, yeah. It seemed like the whole neighborhood was out. Oh, the word spread out quickly. Your father would have been there. Cops came, moved the crowd back, but I sure got a good look. It made the front pages the next morning. I remember one of the headlines was, Blood and Vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Photo took up the rest of the page, showing the body sprawled out. The cart was flipped over with the mug and the Tommy gun when he ran down 2nd Avenue. Stories, the story went that the cops surrounded him down on 23rd Street. He got the electric chair up in Sing Sing about a year later. Life imitating art. Imitating life. Hunts will fast forward to climactic scene of James Cagney as gangster Rocky Sullivan, the boy's hero, walking death row to the electric chair. Now I want to go to the final two scenes. Scene of James Cagney walking to his execution. It is followed by the concluding scene where Pat O'Brien, as Rocky's boyhood friend, now a priest, tells the dead end kids that Rocky screamed for mercy, that he didn't want to die. It ends with O'Brien asking the boys to go to church with him to pray for Rocky's soul. Johnny takes the remote and pauses video. That scene always gets to me. We have to get ready. She'll be here soon. Lights down. Scene five, a diner in L.A., late February, 1987. Saturday, late afternoon and not busy. Hunts, Lee, and Johnny are at a table. The 50th anniversary of Dead End Kids. Lincoln Center was great. That film society really knows how to throw a party. All the stars from the film were there. Joel McRae, Sylvia Sidney, Claire Trevor, all except Bogey, of course. He's been dead a long time. And then Gaby and me, Sid, Sidney Kingsley spoke. And afterwards, I went over to Kingsley and I reminded him of, of my machine gun audition. <laughs> He laughed at that, didn't he, Lee? Sure, fun guy. <laughs> and I thanked him for giving me my career. He felt like a father to me in many ways. Sure, like a father. You would have loved it, Johnny. Your father would have loved it, too. He always liked the movies and the stars. This would have been a good time for your Dad. He always liked the old films. Tell him about the New York School alumni tribute. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that, this is a good one. 
When I got back from New York, I had a call from the head of a group out here called the New York High School Alumni Association. They honor a native New Yorker out here every year who's been prominent in the field. <coughs> he says, I'm beloved by so many fans because of the dead end kids, East Side kids, Bowery boys. So I, I was flattered. It's going to be in October. He made 81 of those movies. He was the only one that stuck all the way through, right through to the last of the Bowery Boys in 1958. No doubt about your longevity with the character, Hunts. Terrific. I've been thinking about something, too. A book about the dead-end kids. Mm. You've been telling me some great stories, and I believe I could put together a film retrospective at the Academy. The classics. Dead End, again. <laughs> It would be in an L.A. audience, so that wouldn't be a repeat of the New York Film Society's 50th. And we could show Angels with Dirty Faces, and they made me a criminal. I like it, I like it. What do you think it'll be? I would say if the high school alumni event is in October, we could do this in November. Just before the holidays roll in. So, Hunts would be the guest of honor two months in a row. <laughs> I was thinking more of trying to bring Hunts, Gabriel Dell, and Bernard Punsley together for this. Hunts, do you think they might be willing? I'd say definitely for Gabe. I could ask Bernard, it's, it's local. So that would be a plus, no travel involved. Bernard's only down in Long Beach. You've always said Bernard was long through with the business. That's right, he's done quite, quite well as a doctor, but he might do this now at the academy. Hey, we're not getting any younger, you know. Good, this could be something. Be nice to bookend with the Film Society. Their tribute to Dead End was at the beginning of the 50th anniversary year. Ours will be toward the end. And with showing two other films, it would be wonderful to have you, Gabe, and Bernard together. Have a Q&A between each film? It would be me and Gabe doing the talking. Bernard's not much for public speaking. But well, why wouldn't you just have Hunts, the way the New York alumni is? This would be tied in with the films, especially because <laughs> it's the 50th anniversary. Uh, I don't see it that way. Plus, Hunts and Gabe argue a lot. Can't you leave it alone? Gabe and me have been friends since 1935, so we argue, so what? In fact, he's one of my best friends. Let's listen to Johnny and let the man do his job. He works for the Academy, knows how to handle this kind of stuff. Sure he does. Lights down, scene six, same diner, two months later, Hunts and Johnny sit at a table. I keep forgetting to ask you about your girlfriend, Francie. How's she doing? Been rough on her. She's still back in Ohio, Ohio taking care of her mom, who's really declining. Her mom has Alzheimer's, and it's reached the point where Francie has put her in a care facility. She can't dress herself anymore, can't walk, doesn't remember much. I'm flying back there to help next week Francie move with her mom. It's nice of you to do that. It shows a big commitment. We do what we have to, right? Francie's going to stay on a few more weeks to see her mom is settled in, getting the right care. Then she'll drive back to L.A. and move in with me. Good, Johnny, good. I'd like to meet her sometime. Sure. I've told Francie about you. She's so excited to meet you. That's a tough deal for her mom. I know some old-timers in the actor's home who have Alzheimer's. I'm just glad I have my memory. Pretty good one, too. Plenty of stories I can tell. Any nibbles on the book yet? I've tried a few publishing contacts I have back east, but nothing so far. Well, nothing happens quickly. And, and you're forgotten. I try to meet with producers at the studios today, and they're just kids with MBAs. They know nothing about movies, nothing about the movie history. They never heard of the Dead End Kids. I, I got lucky making Valentino in 1977 with director Ken Russell, but he's British and not that much younger than me. I, I'm not so familiar with that film. I mean, I've certainly seen Sons and Lovers, and of course, Tommy. Oh, yeah. Ken Russell can be pretty wild. I got along fine with him. I played Jesse Lasky, the silent <coughs> movies producer. It was an art house film, not, not a big distribution, but I was proud to be in it. Now that's 10 years ago. I get some TV work here and there. I was on shows like Jet the <coughs> Giant, Flipper, Chicago <coughs> Teddy Bears in the early 70s. But like another movie part. But like I said, the American movie industry today, <coughs> oh brother. These kids in charge, it's all business to them. Pretty disgraceful. I was always fascinated by Hollywood. I mean, I guess that shows. I received quite a movie education from my dad. About your dad. You know we were talking about me and him meeting in Hollywood and going to Leo's? I remember. 
Well, that all took place before he shipped out to the Pacific. And that was in, in that B-24 crew as a waste gunner. 40 combat missions he did. He got some medals. That I knew. They're kept in my parents' dresser drawer. What you probably didn't know is how rough of a time he had over there. My dad didn't talk about that. He emphasized the friends he made, the places he visited, like Hawaii on leave, and San Francisco when he went up to Northern California for training before heading to the Pacific. And he was discharged in San Francisco, too. That was early August, 1945. Him and me had been writing letters back and forth while he was in the Pacific. Pretty tough time he had. One of their engines caught fire, and they were returning to Saipan from a mission. Said they almost didn't make it. Said he used to go to Mass and receive communion before each mission. And then when he shoot down a Jap, he'd say a prayer for the guy. I know he was always pretty religious, but... Wow. When he was discharged in 1945 in San Francisco, he called long distance and asked if I could stay with me for a few days, heading back east. I said, sure. He came down by train, and I put him up. We did some drinking, especially on VJ Day. Everybody was out on the streets celebrating. A few days after that, I was out. And when I came back to the apartment, I saw Tom standing in the living room. His back was to me, and he's looking out the, toward the window. He was holding on tight to the top of the kitchen chair. He, he didn't hear me come in like he was in a trance or something. Finally, I called his name. Tom! I didn't want to be spying on him. That felt wrong. And he turned around. I saw there were tears streaming down his face. He was pretty shaken up. We sat down, and he told me, He'd been thinking of throwing himself out the window. We were five, five floors up. He said that when he looked out at the sky, he pictured being in combat again, fighting Jap planes. I knew he had woken up a couple of nights screaming. I hadn't said anything. Now I had to. So I told him his nightmares, of his nightmares, and, and reliving being over there in the Pacific, seeing other B-24s go down. When I was in my 20s, my mom told me about Dad waking up and screaming when they were first married. She said they eventually stopped. My dad never got help as far as I know. Same story for many, many guys who came back. Kept it bottled up. Must have been really bad to go through what they did. I had it pretty easy. I got drafted but wasn't in too long. My CO knew who I was. And I wasn't Army material. I was honorably discharged. I asked to make a training film for the Navy. Don't be a Dilbert. Don't kill your friends. I played this dumb Navy bomber pilot who disregards all the flight safety rules and actually does get some other guys killed. So that was how I uh, served, showing what not to do in a comic way. The footage of me in a plane was staged, but the real thing like your father did. But by the, like dark, the, real thing. But by the dark humor, I'm sure you helped pilots learn. Oh yeah, well, I'm glad. I was there for your father. I was glad I was there. And toward the end of August, he said he was re ready to go back to New York. One of his army buddies had a ranch in Glendale. Your dad went there. Even was offered a place to stay and work, but he... He said the pull was too strong from New York. With your grandfather gone and your aunts and uncles married, out of the house, I can understand. So he came home, went into the Carpenters Union, met my mother and then they married. Your father sent me a wedding invitation. I wanted to go, but by then I was on my second wife. She was about to give birth to her son, Gary. I couldn't leave. Life gets busy. More responsibilities. That's for sure, that's for sure. Listen, I came across a photo I want you to have. I was going through some old stuff here. Hutz pulls out a 9 by 12 envelope and hands it to Johnny. Go ahead, open it. Johnny opens the envelope and pulls out a black and white 8 by 10 photograph. He looks at it. Is this from that time you ran into my dad on Sunset? Yep. That must have been sometime in 1943. There was a photographer going around approaching tourists and asking if they wanted their pictures taken, so we did it. Wow. I've never seen this shot. Maybe your father lost his copy. I saw him off at Union Station for a train back east. He still wasn't in the best shape, but he wanted to leave. And the rest is history. Yep, that's what they say. Lights down. Scene 7, late October 1987, late Sunday morning, same diner. 
<clears throat> Lee walks in alone and comes over to Johnny. Where's Hunt? He couldn't make it. He's not feeling well. He seemed okay when I talked to him Friday night. This was sudden. It was an upset stomach. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you really? What's that supposed to mean? Of course I am. Of course I am. Get off it. All you want is to dig into his pockets. What? You with your big plans, a book, a retrospective. Where is it? Where's the commitment? Where's the advance? What advance? I haven't gotten any responses for a book deal. But I do want to go ahead at the Academy with the film retrospective on the Dead End Kids. The past! The past! And how much money is Hunts going to get out of that? He's not getting any money. It's an honor. Did he get money from the NY alumni event or the 50th anniversary of the Dead End at the Film Society of Lincoln Center? I mean, come on, Lee, what's going on? What's going on is that you're just using my husband to advance your own career. How are you trying to move his career forward? Hans is 67. What are you doing to move it forward? You're his manager. I'm a film librarian with a great respect for Hans and his friendship with my dad. That too. You're using him for psychological ends to somehow connect with your dead father. Oh, now you're way out of line. <laughs> I'm going to make a call and ask Hunts if I can come see him. We'll straighten this out. You will do no such thing. As his wife and manager, I forbid you. Why? Do you have Hunts wrapped around your finger? Does he know what you're planning to tell me today? Yes, he's in complete agreement with me on this. He knows what's best for him. He knows what you're up to. I don't believe you. That does not sound like the man I've gotten to know over this past year. The man who helped my dad when he was at his lowest. Go home and look at all the family scrapbooks and photo albums you want. You won't have Hunch Hall to climb on and climb over anymore. You're crazy. Hmm? I picked up that you didn't like me, but I tried to ignore it because of Hunts. What about the respect retrospective at the Academy? Are you forbidding Hunts from coming to that? He was supposed to speak. From now on, consider your relationship with my husband over. I don't care what old movies you show or don't show. My husband is a legend and he will go on to have major roles in movies, TV, and theater once again. You go on then, Lee. Live in your own little world. Oh, I don't have to sit here and listen to your insults. I've had enough. Do not call. Do not contact my husband by any means. Lights down. Scene 8. December 1987, shortly before Christmas. Motion Picture Academy Library, Johnny's office. On his desk is the photograph, now framed, of Hunts and Johnny's father from World War II that Hunts had given Johnny. The final shot from the movie Dead End of the kids on the dock is behind him. Johnny lo no longer has the limp. I called their apartment a few days later. No one answered, so I left a message for Hunt. I asked if we might meet, saying I felt Lee had made a mistake concerning my intentions. I did this in what I felt was a non-judgmental tone, apologizing for any confusion. I expressed that I hoped we could still keep in touch. I never heard back from him. I wrote a letter to Hunts about a week later, expressing the same and adding that my friendship with him was quite important and how glad I was that we'd met. I never heard back. I debated whether or not to send a Christmas card. I'd done it in the December last year, and I decided against it. I had put in the letter how much Hunts meant to me and how grateful I was for his insights about my dad and telling me of their friendship and stories all those years ago and thanking him for the photo. There really wasn't anything else to say. Sending a card would have been merely a formality. So I let it go. But I'm glad I came to know Hunts on my own. I feel that if his wife hadn't been his manager, things would have gone a lot better. She had way too much invested in Hunts' future and couldn't be happy about the past. It's too bad. The Dead End Kids and the later groups have a lot to do with their fans, and I believe those early films really contributed to movie history. I would have gone ahead with a film retrospective at the Academy, but without Hunts participating, I didn't see the point. It kind of cut the soul out of it for me. Hunts walks toward his desk and picks up the photograph of Hunts and his dad. Still, Hunts gave me a lot. It goes way beyond this photograph, but it's wrapped around it. I'll hold on to this as a parting gift. Johnny goes back to his desk and places the photograph in a prominent position. 
He turns off the movie projector, and the image from Dead End goes black. Then Johnny sits down at the typewriter and begins typing the following. No Dead End, a screenplay by John Dunn. The words come up on the screen, projected where the movie image had been. Lights out, end of play. 